Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to the very first Corico Live webinar in conjunction with our very good friends and exceptional buy to let lender, Paragon. My name is Andrew Montlake, and I'm the MD of Corico Mortgage Brokers, and I will be your host for today as we delve into the wonderful world of the buy to let market, hopefully educating and entering into some lively debate around the buy to let market as a whole, the opportunities and the lending market in this arena. Luckily, to help us guide through this journey, I'm joined by some real experts rather than just me spouting on. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome the one and only commercial director of Paragon Bank, Louisa Sedgwick. Welcome, Louisa. Thank you. And to add some more on the ground vision and wisdom, we also have Corico's very own leader in the buy to let arena, our senior advisor, Narinda Gill. Welcome, Narinda. Thank you, Mons. So the way we thought we would do this today would be a little bit of a trial. And uh, please also, we want to try and make it as interactive as possible. So don't be shy with any questions you might have. Um, you can enter them into the Q&A box or the chat box. And we'll endeavour to get to as many as possible. Some we will answer live, some we might answer a bit later. Um, and we will be recording this. In fact, we are recording it. Uh, as long as I press the right button and we can share this afterwards. So what we thought we'd do, we do have some slides, but we're going to use them more of a as a prop to spark some discussion and uh, and questions rather than to go through them presentation style as such. Um, but first of all, Louisa, obviously we're honoured to have you here. Do you want to just Tell the audience a little, a little bit about about you and your and your background and what you do now at Paragon. Yeah, um, believe it or not, I've been within financial services and mortgages specifically for um, thirty plus years. As I say, believe it or not, you know, <laughs> on that one, um, I'm currently uh, the commercial director at Paragon. Um, it sounds like I'm I'm about to disappear off somewhere else. I'm not. Um, I'm I'm staying with Paragon. Um, I'm the commercial director. My responsibilities are for product pricing. Um, distribution and the sales team um, in general. So um, I've had a, a long and varied background within buy to let So um, hopefully I should be able to add some flavour to, to the webinar. I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. So um, let's get going then. So this this slide, I, I mean, it really sort of looks at the, uh, the buy to let market as a backdrop to to where we are now. Louisa, do you want to give us a, an idea of the market last year and where we find ourselves now? Yeah, so I mean, last year was a, it was a tough year. I don't think we can we can mm. get away from that. Um, it, largely because of the price volatility. So there was an awful lot of um, of changes within product pricing and driven predominantly from swaps. And we'll talk a little bit about that, I'm quite sure. Um, there was obviously the challenges that flowed over from the mini budget. So that didn't help us because that took us into it, into a large part of 2023. People were still licking the wounds as a result of that. Um, and I think ultimately because of that, um, it just it, it reduced the lack of confidence in the market. Um, and so we saw a lot of landlords that were sitting on their hands or some of them, you know, I mean, you, you saw the, the rhetoric around everybody's leaving the market, the market, the buy yeah. market is dead, yeah. et cetera. Um, and that that clearly isn't the case. Um, a number of smaller landlords elected to leave the market in 2023 because it just didn't work for them. They maybe had properties in their own name um, or what we would call hobby landlords. So, you know, they maybe only had one or two properties um, didn't have any desire to grow beyond that. And so they just they just didn't work for them. Um, and a lot of landlords through 2023, I think, decided to reshape some of their portfolios as well. So as far as lending was concerned, 2023 was was a tough year um, for everybody and a tough year for landlords. So. You know, coming into 2024, um, you know, Paragon have been around for nearly 30 years um, and January 2024 was was our record month ever um, wow. in 30 years. Yeah. So we had the best um, application month um, ever. And I think a lot of that was because of the pent up demand throughout 2023. 
um, and landlords, you know, as I say, reshaping their portfolio and thinking about what the future held. Um, and also coming into 2024, we saw some really low low rates um, and they have continued. So a couple of spikes um, and then back down again. But I think we've started to see what the shape of the buy to let market is going to look like. Um, you hear UK finance are predicting a £29 billion market again in 2024. Um, I think they're under-egging it. I think it's likely to be nearer to the early 30s and to maybe even into mid-30s. Right. Because it what would you expect a, a healthy buy-to-let market to be in a, in, a, in a normal standard year? You would expect a healthy buy-to-let market to be around 35. Right, billion. okay. It yeah, would that's be a, a really good positive <clears throat> robust market mm -hmm. okay. sorry i'm i'm yaddering on here monty so no, that's all right you can yadder away <laughs> that's what that's why we've got you here louisa <laughs> it wouldn't be a very good seminar if you didn't yadder at all no um, no <laughs> um so yeah so it's interesting then we, we've seen um we've seen mortgage availability and, and and pricing starting to improve then in uh in in recent months, you said that's interesting. January was was like your bit your biggest month, um, and we've seen the buy to let market generally slowly starting to come back again, led by lenders such as yourselves. Um, Narinda, what what have you seen improvement wise coming coming into this year? Um, I've seen a number of improvements that have helped landlords, you know, retain them and. And get some confidence back, really, off the back of last year and certainly the last eighteen months. So, I think the changes in in products over the last quarter, two quarters, and enhancements of product ranges has been really welcomed by brokers. Um, there's been initial shock waves or concerns about you know variable fee structures, for example, mm. and yeah, here to stay. And when used properly, can be quite a useful tool. You know, you, you've got fees now which you know we have not seen for i don't think ever really of arrangement fees in excess of five and seven percent which on the face of it can be you know quite shocking but when used correctly particularly in the southeast of the uk and in london where properties are are lower yielding they can really help landlords mm. um i think enhancements to lending policy come off the back of increased confidence by lenders mm seen the demand for smaller HMOs, for example, and, and landlords wanting to dip into areas of the market that they haven't been in yeah. before. Yeah, Beach. we'll touch on that, yeah, a bit later, yeah. Mm. That's, it. That, that, that's really interesting. That, and that, that pricing is interesting. I mean, I find it now when I look at for, for some of my buy-to-let clients, it's, it's such a, a, a wealth of different products and different pricing and different fees. That's really where where the broker expertise working with the client really comes into play, doesn't it? In terms of working out um, which works best for, for a given it's, scenario. It's all individual circumstances. Well, I speak to a number of landlords who are quite happy to you know, take a, an a loaded arrangement fee to lessen mm. their, you know, to them it's the cash flow. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Mortgage, they want an, an absolute positive cash flow in excess of, as much as they can because they depend on that income as opposed to some clients I speak with, you know, they don't want to be adding any fees and, and don't mind because they've got other income streams elsewhere. So it's, it's all down to you know, personal preference and yeah, you know, looking at your portfolio and what your ambitions are. Mm. And, and Louise, there's, there's something here about, around, you know, the, the mortgage pricing and I, and I love this stuff because it's, <laughs> It's really without without getting too down and dirty and technical and everything. Um, there's been loads of talk around lender pricing and affordability models being difficult for landlords to hit. Can you just shine a little bit of a light on what goes on where pricing is concerned and how swap rate movements have caused so many issues for lenders, especially post the ill fated. Oh, I can't even say her name. Liz Trust. Um, <laughs> um, uh, mini budget. Yeah, I mean, as as we know, um, you know, swaps are driven by external factors. So a, a lot of people talk about, you know, when we see a bank base rate redu reduce, everything's going to be great. And, you know, to some extent that that will be great, um, but that doesn't necessarily influence product pricing. Product pricing is 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 basically driven by swaps and swaps are driven by 
um, external factors. So things mm. like inflation, for example, you know, we, we're talking about potential inflation of being one and a half percent in April. Um, and that will drive swaps down tremendously. But then you could find that there's, you know, there's more problems in the Middle East, for example, which will yeah. drive swaps back up again. Um, and whatever is happening um, within the states generally tends to impact swaps directly as well. So they are impacted by a lot of external um, factors, but there's also a lot of positivity um, behind these. So as I say, if if inflation does come down to one and a half percent in April, um, and we still see, you know, an employment at such a low level. If we look at then the UK, it's actually a great place to invest um, and that will impact swaps. So the chances are, irrespective of whether or not we see a Bank of England base rate reduction in May, I think swaps will cut, likely to be May, um, swaps will come off um, in April as a result of the, um, the, the inflation rates. So, you know, swaps are coming in the right direction. We've had a couple of blips at the last part of um, last month, but this yeah. month has felt pretty static. Um, you know, rates, the swap rates today were 3.85% on five-year money. So they're good because they tipped in excess of, you know, 6%. So, yeah. so we're in a good place um, as far as the market is concerned. And I think that's likely to continue. If we do see a Bank of England um, drop in May, what that will do is just create more confidence in the market um, because irrespective of whether they do impact um, actual pricing and, and product rates, um, they do impact customers' um, you know, sensitivities and the fact that interest rates are coming down, they're likely to feel that little bit more confidence. So um, you know, swaps, swaps are steady, um, which means that our mm. pricing is also steady and it means that we can keep rates out in the market um, for longer. Talking about Narinda and talking about the, the various different fees that are associated with products, the way that a lender would price a product is they expect to get a return on each individual product of whatever yeah. percentage point that might be. So, so long as that rate is the same across the product range, um, they can, you know, they can bring in high rated um, product at the high pay rates with lower fees or lower higher fees with lower pay rates. So long as that same profit margin in effect is maintained, um, it just means that they can be, I suppose, a little bit more innovative. Um, and that's why you'll have seen some of those really high, high fees with lower rates to enable landlords to, to capitalize on those and borrow as much as they possibly can. I, I think that the high rates probably not going to hang around too much longer in the market. And the reason why I think that is, is because we're going to find ourselves having to remortgage some of these properties. And if they've taken a really large fee and we're not seeing the capital um, increase in those properties, you might find that we we struggle to then to get them to fit again. So yeah. I think 5% fees are probably likely to stay in the market for a long time, but those ones that have trips are above 5%, I'm not entirely sure how long that, that they'll be viable. Yeah, I'd market. agree with that. Yeah. So thank you for that. That's uh, that was really useful. So uh, so a big part of this today is is obviously looking around opportunities, and um, we want to be positive about the market, which we we always generally are. And uh, I guess actually I have clients who fit into both the optimistic camp, and then there's those who are who are in the more pessimistic camp. You know, government changes on taxation have have hammered landlords to a degree where some amateur landlords, if I can call them that have or are considering selling up is it is this something you have, have both seen Narinda have you have you seen that kind of thing happening with your clients yeah with without a shirt uh, without a doubt um I've come across many accidental landlords for example who have in, in years gone by decided to either for reasons of not selling their primary residence or wanting to retain it in you know in some instances and become a an amateur and you know, enter the, the buy to let market and become a landlord they're quickly feeling the effects of the tax changes over the last few years mm. um, and you'll typically find uh, the higher rate taxpayers you know they've they've kept their primary residence they've got affordability on onward purchases and decided yeah we'd like an additional income stream but yeah over the last few years the, the financial pressures on that and the tax with the inability to offset your personal finance costs is in some instances, put them in under real strain. Um, so yeah, we're we're seeing purchases of said properties where there are tenants in situ, and you know you quite often dive into and then talk to agents and introducers and find out yeah, 
you know, the previous primary owner is now selling. Quickly find there's a tenant in, in there which is very happy, and for for new purchases and new landlords, it's a good opportunity. Mm. So that's quite interesting, actually. So it, a lot of the driver from the government point of view, going back to George Osborne days, was to to actually uh, encourage first time buyers to buy those properties, but. He's saying then that actually there's a lot of landlord to landlord purchase, and the more professional landlords yeah. uh, are actually snapping up those those properties. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, a lot of the landlords I speak to on purchases are quite often want to understand, yeah, what are they buying? In the first, one of the first key questions I ask is, are you buying it with vacant possession? And quite often they're not; they're buying with tenants. Yeah, and, it's really interesting. And, and over the last six months, um, where interest coverage ratios and there's been a lot of pressure and and, and difficulties in obtaining a higher debts and uh, leverage levels is well how much how much rent are they paying because yeah, that's one of the first things we need to know they might have been a historic legacy tenant sat there for five years paying now under below market uh, value you know there are lenders out there that if not most lenders will lend the lower off passing rent or market rent you know so mm. That's that's one of the first hurdles that we come up against, but we work, you know, we can work with that. There are variable fee, uh, variable arrangement fees out there that can accommodate that type of lend. But yeah, going back to yes, we are seeing previous primary residence holders who have let their properties out, putting them on the market, and typically SPV purchase landlords snapping them up. Mm. And um, without. Uh... You know, we, we know how important the thriving private rental sector is to the housing market and the general economy as a whole. Um, Louise, without getting too political, do you, do you foresee any changes in the in the tax regime anytime soon by, by either party? Because obviously we, we might have a change of government soon. Do you think this is the lay of the land for the, for the foreseeable future? So, so I think... Um... It, it's a really difficult one, isn't it? Because it's a hot, it's a hot potato. Yeah. And none of our current, um, you know, what the current government nor any potential new governments are likely to want to say landlords are great because they've spent so long saying landlords are not so great. So the chances of them actually giving them any tax incentive anytime soon, I think, is fairly limited. I think what they will do um, is review maybe some of the 169 legislations that are currently in place yeah. for landlords that they've yeah. got to adhere to. I think that there'll be some review of that. I mean, some of those legislations go back to the 18th century. I mean, they cannot possibly still be appropriate. So, you know, I think there'll be some sort of review of those legislations. Um, I th my my gut feel is if we see a um, a, a Labour government they'll turn their attention to second homeowners um, mm -hmm. and, you know, potentially overseas uh, investors that are coming in and taking up some of the properties that maybe some of our UK landlords could could benefit from. So I think that they'll turn their attention to that and leave our, um, our landlords alone for a period of time. Um, we might some, see some changes with um, stamp duty reform, but I, I, again, I think that's something that's so yeah. far down the line for us to take advantage of. Um, which is a real shame because, you know, just under 20 percent of our housing stock um, is in within the private rental sector. So, you know, we should be supporting these landlords um, wherever possible. But I think it's one of those. It's a real difficult one for any political party um, to start talking in favour of landlords when they've spent so long bashing them. So I think it's yeah. a real tough one, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, we keep we keep feeding back on the importance of the, the private rental sector and uh, sitting on various committees and into into yeah. into government. Um, but uh, hopefully there there'll be that hopefully there'll be a more, more positive environment. I, I for think landlords. I think yeah I think if you had a, a, a chat on the side with any one of these um, MPs, they would tell yeah. you that they they really do favour the, the PRS etc. Um, yeah. But then when you put them all together, um, I, I'm not entirely sure they're brave enough to to push that one forward, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, just, we shall see. Um, Mons, just, just uh, um, yeah, go on, Narendra, go on. But a point on private rental sector, you know, there's there's quite often a, an area that within that market, students, for example, what I feel quite strongly about. Um, we, we see a lot of student towns cities or across the uk that are well supported by landlords and mm. and needed you know there's you know there are university towns that don't have 
the availability of you know nice student student accommodation digs and whatnot and quite often rely on local housing stock you know, to house the students um we've come across some cities and towns in the uk where there are a large number of landlords now looking to exit the industry um sell up their stock and redeem their loans you know because of the tax changes over the last few years you know typically these are quite often legacy landlords and more experienced landlords that have held stock for say 10 15 20 years and the ones i speak to they're simply you're saying well that they've had enough you know they, mm. they can't get a hold of them in their personal names and whilst they're not often leveraged very high even a conservative and modestly geared portfolio held in personal name can be quite yeah. tricky mm. Yeah, which puts pressure on student accommodation. And I know that from some of my friends' kids who are going off to the university. It's really hard for them to get to get uh to get the right housing. Yeah. But um so it, what what I like this slide, Louise. It, this is really interesting. So this this points to the actually the decline of rental inflation. Can you can you elaborate a bit on this point and the and the positive sides of this that you see, Louisa? So, so I think uh, if you look at rental inflation over the last few years, it's gone like a train. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's at some instances as high as 13 and 14 percent in some areas. I think we were even talking up to 20 percent in, in London, at you know, not that long ago. So I think that whilst it looks like it's slowed, I think it's slowed to a normal level as opposed to slowed and gone backwards. Um, because we were just so, so the inflation rates were so far ahead of where they should have been um, over the last few years that we're now just just basically coming coming into line. But I think what's potentially driving this is that we've got a lot of landlords um, that are supporting their tenants um, and the tenants are remaining within the properties and they're not necessarily negotiating those increases in the same ways maybe they did as the interest rates rose um, rapidly over the preceding two years. So I think where we, where we are now is that, as we've talked about, rates are starting to steady. You know, you're seeing regular rates that begin with a three um, or a standard buy-to-let rate now is about five and a half percent. And that's that's fairly palatable. So I think that what's happened in, in, in the recent history is that, rightly so, landlords have had to pass on some of their increases to tenants. And that's driven up, um, you know, the, the, the tenant inflation or the rental inflation, whereas it's tipping off now because actually we've we've reached a point in time or a tipping point where it actually is need, now needing to normalise. And some of the landlords are now very comfortable with their tenants and actually comfortable with the rent. And they've managed to, to get some decent priced funding. And so it's all working out well. So I think there's a number of different factors. But I think coming from a real high, which is where we got to, to where we are now is just about as normal as it's going to get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's it clearly says though that the demand is is enormous. And um, when you've got 15 households queuing up for any new tenancy, you know, that is that is massive. And the impact of that is that a lot of, I suppose, fringe um, households are not necessarily getting, you know, the, the right level of um, of housing that they need. And we've we've now got there's one point four million households on the social housing waiting list. Yeah. And we've got a million people living in the PRS that should be in social housing. So all of that impacts that demand. Um, and, you know, with that, if you've got a greater degree of demand, then surely there's a massive opportunity to help yeah. to, to service that demand um, by, you know, by offering up more more properties to, to would-be renters. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, um, part of the, one of the themes today is it is, Part of that opportunity is a remortgage opportunity um, that we'll we'll probably see much more predominantly this year than over the past couple of years uh, as rates return to a more stable le level. What what are your stats telling you at Paragon about the size of this market and what what landlords are, are, are looking to do with their their properties this year? So so there are this within um, twenty twenty four. There's two hundred and seventy one million mortgages that are due to mature that are on a fixed wow. rate. Um, and in in April alone, there's four and a half billion pounds worth of fixed rate monies that's going to come to the end of its of its rate. Mm. So 
they you know there's an option that those landlords may decide to um to sell the property if they come to the end of the fixed rate and it's not working for them and um, we're not seeing much of that so we're not experiencing that exodus that has been talked about but like anything else it, i do genuinely think it's been blown up out of proportion um that they, they could potentially stay with their existing lender um having spoken to their broker to make sure that that's the right advice. And if it's a pound for pound remortgage, that might well be the advice. My gut feel for this year is as we see rates start to come down and affordability is, is, is freed up to some degree, I think what we're likely to start to see is landlords saying, do you know what, I'm actually going to take some money out of this property because I want to improve that property or improve something else that's <clears throat> in my portfolio. Yeah. Or actually, I can see the opportunity when I've got 15 tenant households waiting for my next property. I can see that opportunity and actually I'm going to start and buy new properties. So for me, 2020 is going to be a big year for remortgage because rates are going to come down and because it's going to give you know land, landlords the leverage that they need to borrow more money and the only way to do that is to to flip that into a remortgage but i would say you know to, as i've just said then if you think about this this is a massive opportunity for landlords but a massive opportunity to work with their brokers because us as a lender we are not going to contact our landlords and say hey it's time you you know you did a remortgage yeah, because no, exactly. clearly that that's that's a risky proposition for us um whereas if a landlord's working really closely with their broker which is exactly what they should be doing um they're going to get so many other opportunities through other lenders or their existing lender um mm. so so they really need to engage with them a lot more but for me i genuinely think that you know the prs is strong we we have not enough properties within the PRS um, and landlords that are potentially thinking of moving out of the PRS and going back to what Narinda said, we see a lot of inter um, transactions within different landlords. So, you know, landlord A decides to want, wants to sell up, but landlord B is actually increasing their portfolio. So, you know, ideally you'd have a landlord hub where they all talk to each other and they can offset properties. Um, but the you know, landlord that's, pub, that's, I like that. The landlord hub, that is the panacea. Yeah. I would love to see that. Oh, your hub. I thought you said pub. Not pub, no, that's not. It's too early. It should it's be the early. landlord pub. Yeah. <laughs> Just looking, it's what it's one o'clock. We could be in a landlord pub. How brilliant would that be? I love um, that. But idea. I think, but also what we've seen as well to, up until quite recently is you've got landlords that are opting for two year deals. Yeah. Um, so again, if we look into 2025, these these are landlords opted for two year deals in 2023 because they were unsure of what the market was going to uh, was going to do. So 2025 is going to be a positive year for that um, as well. Yeah. And you've also with we're seeing some landlords, not a lot, but some landlords that are now sitting on standard variable rate for a period of time whilst they watch the market. And I think we saw some of that in 2023. And I think that also drove some of the activity in 2024. But all I would say is, you know, if you've got a landlord that's saying I'm going to sit on my on my SVR for two or three months, it doesn't take long for actually to that to to start to eke away at any of the potential mm. um, opportunities or you know, within the other fixed rate market. Um, and I would also I would also encourage landlords not to to wait um, because the rates that are coming out now are really good rates, and these are going to likely to be the norm they're not they're not like we're not we're not going to see rates of one and two percent as we've no, seen not historically so to so, so where we are today is probably fairly normal we might see some drop off but i think it's going to be nominal so i i would suggest that landlords if they are sat on standard variable rate at the minute they may want to start rethinking that strategy and again talking to their brokers mm -hmm. because they they will be able to advise them on that i think there the two things here one one i do think there's a house price play as well around uh, some landlords who, who might be waiting to take out some cash and buy again or waiting for, for when they think actually, and I think it will be this year, when the, the low point in, in house prices will be. Because I think as we start to come out of this year, I think personally you'll see house prices start to strengthen again, certainly going into next year, Q1, Q2 of next year. Yeah, There's a bit of that play as well. But and, and just shoehorning this in here, because I know this is probably a, a, a presentation in its own. You've got the whole green agenda. And I know the government have U-turned on, on some of their changes. But bearing in mind, there might well be a, a new Labour government coming in with, with a different set of priorities. Um, are, are you seeing landlords actually remortgaging and, and 
taking money out to to do up their properties to try and get those those higher EPC ratings. Um, so, so yes, we are at the minute about sixty percent of our landlords who are buying are buying EPC A to C rated properties. Um, right. And, okay. And the others are taking advantage of maybe some of the lower rated EPC properties with with a view to doing them up um, and making them more sustainable. So, mm. you know, we we are seeing more landlords investing in their properties. Um, However, until there's some legislation in place to tell them that they've got to do, you know, there's an element of inertia. And you can understand that when rates have historically been pretty high, then affordability has been a bit tight. It's kind of like I'm just about managing to pay my mortgage. How can I possibly then invest in the property? But, um, you know, we, we, we're talking, you mentioned earlier, you know, we've done a lot of lobbying with the government, as, as have you. Um, and we're talking to the, the, the both governments, um, but the Labour are, are intimating um, that they'll they'll bring the EPC piece back in, um, and the chances are it'll be you know to to be done by twenty thirty. So it's not really going to give us a great deal of time. Wow. So yeah. again, I think that you know any investment that can be made needs to be done now, and appreciate that there's issues around getting you know the right tradespeople to to do all of this. You know all of that it, it needs some sort of um, overhaul. But at the end of the day. We we are going to start hitting up against legislation. I do think that the this is an opportunity to start thinking about what needs to be done. And some of it is really basic. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, strip the strip the whole property back and rebuild it. Some of these things can be fairly basic to like to just to improve that EPC rating. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um I think uh, Narinda, I haven't forgotten about you. <laughs> this is a this is a really interesting part of the debate around landlords incorporating, and it's obviously been been part of the, the the market for some time now. Whether that's moving existing properties from personal to limited company name or purchasing a limited company name, is is this is this now the majority of your business, Narinda? Because certainly, uh, I, I have a mixture actually still, which is which is quite interesting. But 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 what are you seeing? Because you do you do a lot more buy to let than yeah. I do. But I would say it's the majority of my business now. But what I would say it's the majority of the conversations I have. Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. And the reason the reason I'd say it's for that, and sometimes why you know we, I say we, you know, I, I'm quite often talking to clients and their accountants, you know, in tandem, yeah. and quite often join teams meetings with them and and phone calls to have a a three way discussion because quite often lending guidelines and accountancy advice they quite often don't align and in instances where clients want to have discussions around incorporating and, and moving their properties uh, into limited company ownership there's there are a lot of nuances rules and, and guidelines that need to be followed and it's I think only this week I read an article um, highlighting the fact that HMRC will be right into uh, newly incorporated landlords asking them for evidence that they've uh, they, it takes them I think minimum of twenty hours a week to manage their portfolio to to claim a certain incorporation related. right okay um, because there were a lot of knee jerk reactions in the last couple of years where um, individuals have taken advice to incorporate at, must be said um, expensive transactional costs it's not cheap. Mm. Mm. You know, there's, there's stamp duty there's professional fees lender fees it's not a cheap process and if you, you know it's really 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 important to get correct tax advice for yeah. you bland generic yeah. people read and see in forums and you got to talk to you know a very strong experienced tax advisor to make sure you know your portfolio and your scenario it's appropriate to incorporate and be it at you know a middle stage of a professional landlord's life where they're looking to aggressively purchase refinance uh, and and do what they they do or certainly at the end of a, a landlord's lifestyle or or life rather where they're looking to lessen their purchasing and maybe sell one or two units but enter into a stage where they're thinking about estate planning and mm -hmm. you know children and assigning shareholding and thinking about the next stage of the portfolio and their family so there are many times in which a landlord will seek to incorporate have conversations with tax advisors and and brokers because you, you know, you've got to be talking to the right brokers but obviously making sure they've got the right lenders to support mm -hmm. the incorporation itself yeah. and they're experienced in it paragon are brilliant they've, they've done a multitude of 
of um, incorporations and helped some of our clients. Um, but there are many, many lenders out there that will want to see qualified tax advice. And, you know, maybe they've had some some books, uh, some loans that, you know, have, have been caught out or uh, HMRC have looked a bit deeper into the incorporation. But, yeah, a, a lot of what I'm doing organic new purchase wise is is SPV. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I don't think I'd be wrong in saying I can't recall the last personal purchase I did for a landlord in a higher rate tax position mm. other than being in a very unique scenario where they operate, say, a deed of trust and will use a spouse's uh, nil rate tax bans or basic mm. rate tax bans to divert income. Other than that, I actually don't recall the last yeah. person. It's, it's, it's pretty much the standard new buy yeah. to land. Mm -hmm. yeah and um and, and just uh, moving on from that a, a, a little bit we've got um landlords are looking away from the traditional ast models as well like they're looking away from personal names to to uh, uh to incorporation so hmo multi-unit holiday le lending all seems significantly up um as a lender, Louise, are you, are you therefore are you seeing this? Are you therefore constantly reviewing your lending portfolio around what you, what you offer to to landlords? Yeah, I mean, if we look at um, for us, thirty five percent of all of our business is on HMO, so it's massive. Um, right, wow, thirty five percent. Okay. Yeah, thirty five percent, and I think that's largely because tenants are opting for shared living, whether they actually yeah. want to share with anybody or whether it's just. The circumstances, you know, make them share with them. And we also do a lot of student lets as well. So, of course, that would sit under um, HMO. But, yeah, we, we've we seen a move towards um, HMOs. We've, we get the good, bad and the ugly um, uh, sent to us. Um, and, you know, we don't obviously... Uh, lend on all of them but um you know we are we are strong in hmo but and we have seen that move towards that and i think that is largely driven by affordability um and th they're strong across the whole of the uk not quite so much in um in scotland because they don't really have your traditional type hmos where you've got shared living for professionals and things like that they clearly have them for uh, for students but not much beyond that but yeah it's a it's a big thing for us uh, we don't do holiday lets. Um, we used to do, but we moved out of the, the holiday let world largely because we weren't actually very good at it. Um, and also because we, we do see that there's some potential um, PR issues further down the line. But that's that's our choice to do, yeah. not to do that. Yeah, not you're not the only lender who's decided it's... that on, on holiday lets, are you? Yeah, I, and I, I can't help thinking, as I say, if if we do get a change of government, then that's where a lot of their focus will will start to to go towards, yeah, um, yeah, rather than people's actual homes. Um, but I mean, for us, the most popular popular properties still remain, you know, the terraced um, properties, old Victorian terrace, the the good old drafty ones um, that are probably going to need to to have quite a bit of money spent on them to get them up to to you know a, a C rated EPC. Yeah. Um, or it's or detached properties, semi and, and detached properties are still the most popular for us. Yeah. Um, going back to the point about um, the limited company piece and incorporation um, of all of the PRS, 80 percent of it is actually in people's individual names. So it's so still only 20 percent of it is sat in, in that limited company space. And I think that that is changing massively um, for Paragon. Eighty five percent of our business is in a limited company. So, right. you know, we are, we are very, um, you know, but we deal with very big landlords and they've got um, yeah. you know, quite yeah. a number of properties. So the likelihood is they will hold them in that limited company space. But again, going back to that remortgage opportunity, I think that a lot of this, it's not a remortgage, it's a sale and a purchase when you move it from um, your own name into an incorporation. But I do think that will drive quite a lot of activity this year as well. Mm. Okay. And, and the big question is around profitability, obviously, for the landlords indeed any business but um uh louisa do you want to guide us through through this slide so 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 i love this slide and i think actually yeah i like this slide nothing it's else really this, you know, this is what we should be sharing because actually yeah. when you know when they are landlords are allegedly running to the hills because nothing works you look at this and it actually does work you know most most lenders most landlords are you know pro, are making a profit from their properties 
um, because of the way in which they're structured or the type of property that they've got. It's, there's very few that are saying, I'm not making any money on this. And the ones that do are the ones that, you know, uh, Narinda talked about high rate taxpayers that have got these um, in their own name. And yes, it doesn't work anymore. So actually, those are the ones that are not making any money from the prof properties. But the bottom line is, is that, you know, prop property is still a very good, solid investment. And whether you're looking for capital gain on your property or you, whether you're looking for income, both of which to, depend on the type of property that you elect to buy and then weighing the structure in which you buy it, it's actually a really good viable proposition. So I think it, it, there's a lot of positivity around this. And this slide to me just tells me this is, you know, this is a, a good, uh, a good way of investing. Mm. And then uh, sort of the, the last slide we, we've got here is around um, the real drivers of, of demand for, for rental property. Um, does this all, all ring true for you? For you? Yes. Um, I mean, student lets, we talked about it earlier, the students, three students for every bed. I mean, arguably, I think that's been going on for years, so I wouldn't necessarily say that's anything new. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> yeah. Three students for every student bed, should we say. Um, so, you know, there's still an awful lot of, of demand um, within students. We're you are seeing a lot more of corporate um, investment in that, um, which, of course, will, will help the private landlords because they can then, you know, buy up the properties that we talk about that's the bread and butter. Um, so, you know, that will help. We're still we're seeing a little bit of build to rent, um, mm -hmm. which is purpose built, um, but it's tiny and it's not even starting to make any, you know, sort of imprint into to the lack of housing stock or the demand around housing. So, um, you know, I think demand for rental property is going to continue to grow. Population is growing. Affordability is challenged, especially for first time buyers. And if you've got a single first time buyer, um, the likelihood is they're going to be into, you know, their early, the, the mid to late 30s before they can even think about buying a property. So nobody wants to stay at home. Well, some kids might want to stay at home until they're in their late 30s because it's probably really cheap. Um, but as a parent, if my daughter decided to still be here at 37, I wouldn't be. So I think that, um, you know, that, that there's, got, there's got to be some give. So to me, if we've got a, you know, the population is growing and age, the aging population also look to, to rental properties. So this is, this is a really good market to be in. Um, and it's only going to go one way, which is mm. growth. Yeah. And, and Narinda, just very briefly, what, what are you seeing with the, the rise of the new type of landlord Are you seeing anything different yes um very much so. that's it's a really interesting question actually because the i've been thinking about you know what changes have i seen with the landlords i've worked with if, over the years and there has been a, an involvement in my opinion of awareness um use of different types of lenders products um it's without a doubt more SPB led now than it ever has been. But landlords are becoming more and more tech savvy. Yeah. Um, using tools such as automated values, you know, with brokers like ourselves, understanding not the traditional routes of financing a property, but the more finer details like, you know, how can we, you know, get to certain debt leverage levels with higher higher arrangement fees. I'll, I'll have landlords phone me up and say have you got anything that can get me to this on this property, for example? And they're aware of where the cost of money is at the moment. Um, and they'll be talking to me and, and vice versa. I'll be talking to them. We've had this limited tranche of funding come in. There's a fixed fee product on there or there's a there's a fee there's a, a, a fee rated, pro a high arrangement fee on this one. We can get you on this property you saw a few weeks ago. Um, at the same time, they're, they're reading. You know, they're, they're seeing in the, in the press and in the news the volatility of money markets and the sensitivity to that so for me yeah there's there's definitely been a change in the mindset of landlords over the last five years definitely with them becoming more aware of non-bank lenders entering the both buy to let market stepping away from you know traditional lenders that have been in the market 10 15 20 years and and knowing how best to use certain types of lenders and uh, and, and Paragon being very strong in that space and accommodating more complex securities. So, yeah, that's mm. it's, it's 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 that line of communication that's that's there with landlords and them using that more than ever. Mm. Okay, and um, yeah, I mean, for me, the future is is 
is all around the re the relationship between the client, broker, and lender. And yeah, we're we're lucky enough to have some exceptional relationships with lenders, and this this partnership is is really key for for us, and it, it really helps the clients. Um, I think we're almost out of time, Louise. I'm going to give you the last word. Is it is it any sort of last words of wisdom you would like to to impart? So my my words of wisdom. Um, so I I think uh, this this year is going to be a, a really good, strong, positive year for Bytela, and it'll go into next year. Um, we'll drive. We'll see some driving confidence. I do think if swaps remain as they are, or even tick off a little bit further. Um, then we're going to see an awful lot more choice in the market um, and lots of lenders competing with each other, which is a great thing um, for landlords because ultimately it means that, you know, they get the best possible rate. Um, and with that in mind, I would suggest that um, stop sitting on the hands uh, and maybe start to, to make some movement because I do think this year is going to be a really good opportunity for them. Mm. Thank you very much. So to wrap it up, it seems that the death of the buy-to-let market has been very much exaggerated and mm -hmm. it is alive and well. In fact, we may just be on the cusp of a bit of a renaissance. Uh, it is important to keep feeding back to regulators, MPs and government around the importance of this sector and the thriving private rental sector. Working in tandem with the only occupier market is absolutely key, not just for the health of the property market, but the overall economy. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you to Narinda and Louisa and everyone at Paragon who helped us. It really is great to have lenders such as yourselves in the market. So thank you. Until next time, have a great day, a successful and prosperous year. And remember, we are always here at Corico to advise and help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.